So I keep procrastinating because I'm really kind of nervous about this. And I know I shouldn't be, but, you know, there, in, that, in the back of my head is that thought, who am I to try to teach anybody about the Bible? Um, but you know what? I know that that is just the evil one trying to get in my head and keep me from sharing the word of God, which is what God wants me to do. So regardless of how nervous I am, I'm going to bite the bullet and say welcome to the very first Bible for Beginners, Grace Notes with Lori. Um, we're going to start today with the preface of John. And I don't know if you guys want me to like pop this up on the screen so you can see it um, or not. Uh, for today, I'm going to leave it down, but I will show you quickly what it looks like when it's up. And if you guys would prefer, I can certainly have the text up here as part of the screen with me um, while we're doing this. So be sure to leave a comment as to which you prefer, whether you like to read along or if you just want to hear me. So for today, you're just going to hear me, and that's that's going to be it. So anyway, this is a preface to the study of the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John was the last of the four accounts of Christ's life to be written. John, who was the last living apostle, ministered in Ephesus, which had become the center for Christianity in the last decades of the first century. So long time ago, first century. <laughs> John's gospel is an eyewitness account and relates the life of Christ to the church. Each gospel has a specific audience, and the audience for this gospel is the church, which is you and me. You and me, we are the church. Um, there's an explanation for that. I don't remember where it is, because like I said, who am I to teach you the Bible? I don't know all the back and forth. I'm learning it as I read it to you. So luckily, these lessons that I have here uh, are super helpful, and the person who wrote them does know the Bible very well. It's my uncle, uh, who is a Bible scholar and actually has translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew. He learned both languages so that he was able to actually get back into the bones of the Bible. And he wrote this lesson, so pretty confident that it's going to be pretty accurate. Um, if it's not, talk to him. <laughs> uh, I'll give you, I'll leave his website down in the bottom and you can certainly contact him on his website. Anyway, let's keep going. Um, following the introduction, which establishes the eternal pre-existence of the deity of Christ and the birth of the humanity of Christ, when the divine person took on a human nature. John relates the events of four days, four days in the divine diary. So John chapter 1, verse 19 to 23. And this is the witness of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny. And he confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. They said then to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So John's ministry was to announce the coming Messiah to prepare the way for the advent of Jesus Christ. In the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 7, But then he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure how that relates, but Let's maybe look at that again. John's ministry was to announce the coming Messiah to prepare the way for the advent of Jesus Christ. And then in Matthew 3, verse 7, But then he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. He said unto them, unto them this is the voice of Jesus, O generation of vipers, 
who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Because he knows what's coming. As a result of this preaching of the truth, the religious crowd went out to attack him. John chapter 1 verse 28 tells us that in this scene, John was at the Jordan River near Bethany. This is significant in that this is the point where Joshua led Israel into the promised land in 1400 BC. Interesting. He reminded the people that they were a chosen race and that God had for centuries been preparing them for the coming of the Messiah. The religious leaders asked John three questions. Who are you? Are you Elijah? And are you the prophet? Very strong in the Greek, you, as in who do you think you are, kind of, is what these religious leaders were asking him. His, John's answers were simple. I am not the Christ, I am not Elijah, and I am not the great prophet. People do not like situations that do not fit their preconceived ideas of what the world should be. Their inflexibility makes them intolerant, and their traditions become more important than the truth. Some examples of these types of questions that they give are, what are you? A Christian? What is your church? What denomination? What this? What that? Going nowhere, they, they, they were back in the, in the end of the first century here. Getting nowhere, they appeal to him by saying that they have to give the religious leaders an answer when they get back to Jerusalem. John's reply, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. John knew precisely who he was and what his mission was. He was a voice. A voice. Doesn't make an issue out of personality. A voice. Doesn't make an issue out of heritage. A voice. Doesn't make an issue out of education. A voice is heard but not seen. And the words endure long after the voice is silent. John the messenger recognized it was the message and not the man. And then he quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And here's a note. God, John stayed with the word of God, not personality and not his relationship with the Messiah, because John was um, the Messiah's cousin which there's stories about that too. <laughs> so um, if we if we keep going with these, someday we might get to them. I don't know. We'll see. It's, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. It's a big book. Um, anyway, these religious leaders had, had come out of a great temple in Jerusalem. They came to a wide spot in the desert along the Jordan River. Quite a contrast, but John is in the wilderness, and the people who want the truth are coming out to him. John did not go to the center of religion to begin a ministry. He did not attempt to reform the apostasy of Jerusalem. He went to the wilderness, and he was successful without a building in the desert, yet the people came to hear the word of God. John chapter 1, verse 24 to 27. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So this talks about the Pharisees coming on the scene. They oppose everyone but themselves. Oh, does that sound familiar? Uh, <laughs> yet they compromise truth at every turn. They were the hypocrites of Israel. They asked, why are you baptizing if you are not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? Correct, note, here's another side note. The religious leaders correctly saw baptism as an identification. Um, if John was not anyone important, why baptize people to identify them with someone who claims to only be a voice? But they missed the point. John was baptizing to identify born-again Jews with the kingdom 
which the king was to usher into being. So let's read that again. John was baptizing to identify the born-again Jews with the kingdom which the king was to usher into being. So I don't know much, but something that I do know is that um, the Old Testament lays the foundation for the New Testament. And although there is a big difference in following the rules and the laws that guided the Old Testament until the Messiah came to die for our sins, um, the Jewish people um, wanted to be baptized to be to recognize that they that they wanted the Messiah. I think I don't know. Anyway. Let's go on. <laughs> I'm not cutting that out. I'm not editing these. I'm just going to let them go. In verse 26, John centers their, their attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. The refutation of those who reject the word of God is not found in text, but context. And the context of the whole Bible is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So here's some principal points. John did not need to defend himself only put the attention on his Lord, Jesus Christ. Others were involved in credentials, personality, institutional religion. John was involved with a person, Jesus Christ. When questioned, John answered with scripture, the word of God, which is the mind of Christ. John is an example of the believer totally occupied with Jesus Christ, and when we partake of commun communion, we are reminded that our faith is wrapped up in Christ. Christ is the reason for our being. He is the one who came to pay a debt he did not owe on behalf of those who could not pay. As we gather together as a church, we desire that Jesus Christ becomes the most important person in our lives and that the word of God becomes the most important thing in our lives. As Christians, we are called to continually focus rivet our attention on Jesus Christ. He came to pay a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. Who does the world say Jesus Christ is? In Luke 9, chapter, or chapter 9, verse 20, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do ye say that I am? Since that time, men have been asking that question, but do not often come up with the right answer, as did Peter when he proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah of God. Since the second century AD, there have been those who would deny the deity of Christ and others who deny the humanity of Christ. This runs in cycles, first one hearsay, then the other. Today, man's regard of the Savior, the Son of God, has fallen into basically four categories. That Jesus was a great teacher, a great man, but entirely human. He is not to be worshipped, but to be followed as an example. We can believe the compassion of Christ, but stories of his resurrection are later additions and totally fables. Another view, a second view, sees Jesus as a good man as are many good and sincere men of history. We are to follow his example in our relationships with others and our sincerity towards God, but he was not God. A third view sees Christ as an example or model of all men, a man who had evolved to a higher point than any other man and set new standards of nobility for men, a standard which each person can obtain if not in this life, the next, or the next, or the next. Keep trying until you get it right type of theology. The fourth view sees Jesus as a man upon whom came the Spirit of Christ at his baptism, empowered him for three years, and then left prior to the cross. This New Age view sees this Spirit of Christ, or Cosmic Christ, as a spirit that can descend upon any man today. Thus, there have been and will be other Christs. Of course, each of these views denies the literal 
and true interpretation of the scriptures that state that Christ is fully God and fully man in the incarnation as eternal God. So let's say that one more time. Each of these views denies the literal and true interpretation of the scriptures that state that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man in the incarnation as eternal God. John Wolverd, former president of Dallas Theological Seminary, states, all modern, all modern defections from the doctrine doctrine of the deity of Christ assume that the Bible is not authoritative or final in its revelation of this doctrine. And where is the authoritative and final revelation according to these defectors? In their minds, in they, as they, in their wisdom, attempt to understand the Christ who made them. Christ's pre-existence is assumed fact in the New Testament. The early Christian well knew the deity and humanity of Christ. It has taken man this long to evolve to the point of denial. As the Old Testament assumes without defense the existence of God, the New Testament assumes without defense the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. All that we find recorded in the Word of God is there for a single purpose, to reveal to us the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we read of the Lord's might and power, his perfect character, his care and control over his people. We read in the Psalms of his compassion and Proverbs of his wisdom. The scriptures teach us about Christ. In the epistles, we read of his perfect order and endless provision of grace. And in the Gospels, we meet the one who is both God and man and came from heaven to be our Savior. A Latin inscription found in the catacombs under the ancient city of Rome reads, I am what I was, God. I was not what I am, man. I am now both, God and man. And we know that Jesus Christ is God and man because of what was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The portrait that is painted of the person of Christ in the Gospels is so vivid that we can see ourselves at his side, and we can see him caring for us, teaching us, and providing for us. It is really, though, just a partial picture. A student at Dallas Theological Seminary some decades ago wrote down all the words of Jesus found in the four Gospels. He then read them in a normal conversational manner. The total time taken to complete such a task? Weeks or days? No. Only three and a half hours. The entire earthly life of our Savior is revealed to us in three and a half hours of conversation. It is no wonder that John ended his account of the Christ with this statement found in John chapter 21, verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books which were written. The portrait is only a simple line, drawing, blah, sorry. <laughs> the portrait is only a simple line drawing, but the life of the Christian living with Christ fills in the lines, giving depth and perspective and color to the brief portrait drawn by these four evangelists. John's gospel stands alone and apart from the other gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, and that word means to give an overview, an account from the same position. Hence, we can parallel the accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not the gospel of John. John is writing much later than the other writers. He writes, primarily to believers, the church, us, and his emphasis is on the deity of Christ. Over 90% of what John records is not found in other Gospels. Through the Spirit of God, John tells us things about Jesus that we would otherwise not know. Each synoptic Gospel begins by placing Jesus in a historical setting. 
With Matthew and, Matthew and Luke, it is the extended historical setting of his humanity and his genealogy. With Mark, we see the historical setting of the ministry of Christ, beginning at his baptize, baptism. John begins in a much different place. He begins his account of our Savior, where it all began and where it all will end, in eternity, in the heavens, with the ever-existing Son of God. And that's the end of today's reading, the preface to the study of John. So I know there's a lot in there. Uh, I've read it a couple of times now, and there's always something new every time I read it. And feel free to go back and listen. And again, don't forget to let me know whether you would like me to have this text up on the screen like this while I'm reading it, and it will move, I'm assuming, as I read it. Ah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, it'll move as I read it, so that you'll be able to see it if you want to. Um, but let me know. Let me know if you like that, or if you just prefer um, to have me read it. Anyway, Thanks so much for joining me. I will see you next time. I actually study the Bible every night. So uh, I'll probably do a lot of these, which is one of the reasons I'm not going to edit them. I'm just going to record them and throw them up there. And there will be no intro, not yet. I may try to come up with a quick little intro for this sooner or later. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that is what it is. God bless you. I will see you soon. Take care of yourself. Bye now.